is our four, our eighth actually session of the entire series to end our week off. Um, and we have another full week next week. Uh, so, Buju, Mino Nogshig, Ozawa Makuts, Nadijnikaz, Bikechinong Nadunjaba, Makwa Nadodam, Ikinamaga Zadendao, and Ishnabek Kwan Dao. My English name is Jawan Shagnash. I am from Bikechinong Territory and I am Bear Clan. I am the Special Projects Teacher for Indigenous Studies for our board for the secondary program. I have recently been in this role and are excited to be a part of this team that organized this. Um, we put a slew of speakers together and when we were looking at this topic, I had been working with Tyler and had not known his story prior. And when I heard his story, it was so impactful. And even when you grow up with people or know who they are, we don't necessarily understand or know their story. And when I was thinking about this, I was like, Tyler has a great story and he's such a well-spoken man. And I have worked for him. I was lucky to work with him for quite a few years in the education system. And he is um, Oneida and Ojibwe from Bikedronong territory. He's been married for 14 years with three children and for the past eight years has been working with Indigenous youth, first for Walpole Island Secondary School program, and then most recently with the Greater Essex County District School Board. He has been able to guide and support through his learning and experience, experiences growing up as a First Nation, on, well, on a First Nation reservation. He is truly honored to be a part of so many Indigenous youth lives, and he believes it's important to be humble, but confident person in a student's life. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Tyler White. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jawan. Um, that was an amazing introduction. I was like, where did she get all of that? And then I realized that I think I sent it to her. Um, so <laughs> we're, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you today um, is actually something that I came up with uh, one of my coworkers, um, uh, Tina DeCastro. Well, I'll, I'll talk about, more about her later. Um, so I'll kind of introduce myself again. So, Buju Ani, Tyler White Indigenous Cause of Bikajanong Dunjaba. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tyler White. I am a First Nations person, more specifically. I am an Ojibwe and Oneida from uh, Bikajanong territory. I feel like I'm, uh, Jawan kind of took some of the words out of my mouth here. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Like I said, working with Jawan has been, been, been a blessing. Um, I've had many different educators um, that I, I've learned from, um, that I that I strive to be like. I guess you could say uh, Jawan's definitely one of those. Um, so I have some some mentors, some heroes, um, and and I'll talk more about those as I go along. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, intergenerational trauma uh, in Indigenous students. So uh, these first couple here are. Um, more along the lines of uh, just little introductions about myself. Um, so I work with what's called the Open Minds Program for the Greater Essex County District School Board. Um, there's uh, two other workers like myself um, and uh, a, a curriculum, uh, an Indigenous curriculum lead, who, uh, her name is Tina DeCastro. I work with Brianne John and Adrian Klein, who both do the same um, support work that I do um, across the school board. Um, and and we, we, we have a great team. We have an amazing team. Um, actually, I like to, I want to share this Open Minds logo because it comes from a student uh, from Walpole Island who's living in Windsor. When I um, moved to, or I shouldn't say moved to Windsor, when I started working in Windsor, he, um, he came with me. He, he, he was in grade nine when I was working at WDSS. And then he, he moved to Windsor the same time that I got the job in Windsor. Um, so he was a, he's an amazing student. Um, he created this logo. His name's Dayton, um, and and he's 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 going to be graduating this year. Um, very excited for that. Even in this pandemic time, um, to watch him him grow and 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 become who he is now is is quite an amazing thing to see. So, wanted to put a little shout out to uh, Dayton for for our awesome, amazing Open Minds logo. Um, so the Open Minds program again. I'm a First Nations Métis and Inuit student support worker. Um, like I said, I'm one of the three workers with um, Brianne and Adrian, um, and then of course Tina DeCastro, who is the uh, 
indigenous curriculum lead. Um, and she helped me create this PowerPoint um, for uh, PD uh, for the Greater Essex County District School Board. Um, she's an amazing person as well. I, I know maybe some of you have met her. I'm not sure if I know John's met her. Um, Tina, I, I can't say enough about her. She's, uh, she, she's, like I said, she's a mentor. She's a hero. She works very hard at what she does. And, and, and I, I strive to, to kind of keep up and, and just, you know, stay, stay with her and learn from her and, and really get that, that, that guidance that she has. And, um, she always says, and of course I'll say that she's not indigenous, uh, um, but, uh, she's worked very hard to create that awareness and understanding as a non-Indigenous person um, to help out Indigenous people and to help, you know, better uh, the Greater Essex County District School Board. Um, it's come a long way with, with from what I understand. Uh, I've been there for a short time, um, but, you know, Tina and a lot of others have worked very hard um, to get it where it is today. Um, I support students with academics, uh, cultural components, and general well-being. Um, right now that looks a little different. It's all virtual. Um, I sit at home on my computer and meet with students. Uh, I, I plan, uh, I guess you could call it recess or nutrition break events as well um, throughout the day and, and, and just kind of put the culture components in there. And then of course, helping students that need it. I do work with self-identified uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit students um, to ensure that they're feeling okay and doing well with their academics. I usually help with what they're learning on. Um, with. Um, so they might get the lesson, then I can, you know, work with them one on one, or in bigger groups, depending on how many there are. Um, and, uh, of course, general well being, I'm, I'm the per person that they might talk to that they might trust, and then I can help them find, you know, that better, um, that better support, I guess you could say, you know, social workers, child and youth workers within the within the school ward and stuff like that, I can, I can steer them in the right direction. Um, or if it's something smaller that I can help with, then I'm there to help. Um, and of course, I'm aligned to different schools. All of us are. There's so many schools within the Windsor and Essex area. Um, so we all have a certain amount of schools. Um, I can never remember it off the top of my head, but I, I have um, a few high schools and then lots of elementary schools. It's usually the schools that feed into um, the, the, the high school, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I'm an Oneida and Ojibwe. Um, my father is from Oneida and my mother is from um, Walpole Island here. I am married with three uh, wonderful kids. Um, I have uh, my wife who uh, we've been together since we were um, 17 years old, uh, grade 11. Um, she just graduated with her uh, bachelor's of education or bachelor's of arts in uh, ecology, bachelor's of ecology, I think you want to say. Uh, it's so confusing. I try to remember it because I'm so proud of her and what she's done. Um, I, I, I should I should memorize it. She graduated from Brescia and Western um, just this year, just in, in uh, at the end of April here. Um, we've we've been together for a long time. We've we've failed together. We've succeeded together and we've built our lives together. And I always say that I can't I, I wouldn't be um, where I am today without without my wife, Shannon. Um, I wouldn't be the man I am today. Um, I wouldn't be I probably wouldn't even be sitting here before you. She's, she's pushed me um, so much and she's supported me in, in that as well. Um, she's been a great motivator to let me know that I'm, you know, that I can do better and that, you know, I'm capable of these types of things. So it's great to have her by my side. Um, and, then, and of course, we have three amazing kids. Um, Addison, who's in graduating grade eight, uh, your typical teenager. Um, she's uh, definitely uh, uh, in that teenage mode. I don't know if anybody has teenagers here, but Wow, it's, uh, it's quite the experience. <laughs> um, and I have a son uh, in the middle. Um, he's in grade five. Um, he's doing great. Uh, everything seems to come in with him with ease. And then I have my youngest one, Lorelai, who goes to school on Wapla Island. They all go to school on Wapla Island, but I, I really like what's special about Lorelai is um, she's in an Ojibwe immersion uh, course um, here on Wapla Island. And it's, it's really taking off. She's really starting to get it. Um, she can speak. She's actually able to hold conversations with my grandfather. Um, not long ones, but she can, you know, she can, she can understand and talk and reply. Um, and that's something I can't do. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll talk about more about that in a, in a bit here. Um, and I've lived on, on Walpla my entire life. Um, I only spent eight months away when I went to Mohawk College. 
um, me and my wife thought we could be do it on our own and, and everything else. And unfortunately, we came back with our tails between our legs, asking for forgiveness and and saying, you know, we can't, we couldn't, we weren't quite ready yet. We weren't ready to do it yet. We tried, but we realized that there was a lot more for us to learn, and, and we had to come back and, and kind of um, figure out what we needed to do. Um, but other than that, I spent my entire life on this First Nation, um, and I'm very proud of where I am. Uh, I'm very proud of where I'm from. I'm very proud to call myself a member of the Kejanong Territory, um, and uh, I'm proud to tell that to you guys today, um, and, and here I am, so uh, that's a little bit about me. We'll get into what I'm going to talk about, um, which is intergenerational trauma. Of course, we all know that it's trauma that can be transferred between generations. Um, some of the, the reasons for Indigenous people's intergenerational trauma, of course, is, is uh, residential schools. Um, is obviously the biggest one, um, which is going to be a big part of what I'm talking about today. Um, the 60 scoop, um, continued uh, systematic racism um, on Turtle Island and just racism in general. Um, a lot of people uh, think differently uh, of Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, Inuit people. And, you know, there, there's, there's others. It's not there. What our, I feel like our situation is unique um, when it comes to the, the, the building of Canada and North America for that matter, um, of Turtle Island. Um, of course, the Indian Day Schools, which was something that I didn't really think of until um, I realized I was a part of it. Um, and what they were, what they were still trying to do. Um, so I thought that was very interesting as well. Um, and, and you know that lasted up until 1990. And, and when I went to the elementary school here on Walpole Island, it was still considered an Indian Day School. So I was a part of that when I didn't even realize it. And I didn't even realize that it had um, that heavy, that heavy of an impact on me. Um, so it was, it's very interesting. So. Um, Sorry if you heard that. Um, I'm sitting in my car. <laughs> my internet at home was bad. Uh, it's still bad. They're working on it um, throughout Walpole Island, but um, unfortunately, it's it's not the best. So uh, I'm sitting in my car in a mall parking lot with some. I think I'm stealing Wi-Fi. Let's not tell anybody about that. Um, we'll just hopefully uh, I won't get in too much trouble uh, here. And so I wanted to kind of get into the the story of my. Um, of my grandparents um, and, and kind of talk about, you know, what, what they went through and, and, and realize that every indigenous person has a different story when it comes to um, how they were being raised, especially in the residential school era or time. Um, so um, again, my, my mother's side, her grandfather, my grandfather, um, Cecil Eric Isaac Sr. went to residential school. He went to uh, um, the Mohawk Institute in Brantford. And uh, at the age of five, um, he was in, he was playing outside and he said uh, a cop and a priest pulled up in a truck and they offered him ice cream and he took it. And then he, he went into the truck and he got in it and he said he fell asleep as he was eating it because he realized he was being taken somewhere. Um, and then he went somewhere far and he said when he woke up, he was at the residential school. And, and that, that was it. That was that, that's how they took him there. Um, they basically kidnapped him and stole him away. Um, so it was, it, it, and he tells lots of different stories and, and I listen to them and, and I know my, my family listens to them and stuff and we all have, have heard different things and the different horrific things that he's gone through. Um, you know, he, he was there until he was 13 and he finally left. Um, he, he, he ran away. Um, and, and he went and, and eventually got back to Walpole Island, started working. I don't want to get too much into, into, uh, into detail um, because I know I got a lot to talk about. Um, but he did, he did leave. He has lots of different stories and, and, and they're, they're heartbreaking. Um, some of them are uplifting and, and heartwarming um, where he talks about his friends that he met and friends that he made. Um, but then he talks about, he, he told me one where he had to, um, he would go down and get the, the oatmeal, the mush from, for dinner, or breakfast or lunch, and, and he would have to bring it up and he would be picking out the, the, the rabbit or the mouse poop and the mouse feces and, and everything else as he was trying to bring it up to the kitchen for it to be cooked. And he said, he even remembers looking at some of the mush that he ate that was prepared that had it, had feces in it. That, and, and, you know, that, that was his, that was his dinner and in no way 
um, throughout this throughout this conversation, I can't compare um, my myself to my papa or my my great grandmother, who I'm going to talk about. Um, but there there's those things there there's those underlying instances that that carry on through through me, um, and we'll get into that. But I would never ever compare myself to my papa um, or my nanny that I would did that I went exactly what they went through because I didn't. Um, and it's all about that turnaround and, and what we're doing about it. Um, so uh, my papa got married um, at a young age and he had um, my mom um, and six others and, and they all grew up, but they didn't know much. Um, papa never really spoke. I, it, he, he didn't want to teach them anything. Um, he was afraid um, what might happen to them you know, what, what, what would go on? He was busy. He had to get to work. Um, in that, in the, in that life, he had to go to work all the time. He had a lot of uh, people to support, a lot of mouths to feed. Um, and then he was living with this trauma, um, that he had grown up, that he had grown up with as a kid. And so, um, when it came to my, my mom, um, she didn't have much to teach me, um, when, 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 when I was born. So I'll get over to my nanny. My nanny was from Aquasasni, Aquasasni. Um, she's a Mohawk. And she's actually in that picture um, on the far right. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I can't actually see it because of the way my things is. But there's a little handsome little boy there, and that's me. Um, uh, I was a really good looking young guy. Um, and I, I, I kind of lost that as I got older, but um, I was pretty good looking when I was little. <laughs> but then we get into uh, my nanny, um, if you look at her. Uh, she's in the middle holding my my cousin Freddie's in the blue shirt but she's in the middle of this picture and she has blonde hair and and pale skin and from what I understand my my grandmother um, said that nanny was taken to and she calls it an orphanage she was taken to the Mohawk Institute as well but she always called it an orphanage I never corrected her because I don't, I don't know if she completely understands or if she cares to understand. So I've never gotten into it with my, my, my grandmother about what the residential school truly was. Um, but she said at the age of three, my nanny went there. And that's the earliest, like I've heard five, um, six. I've never heard three, but, but she said she went there as an orphan. And I don't have any information. And my, my great grandma has some slight information about, uh, or my grandma has some slight information about her grandparents and stuff, but not much. Um, so she went to the residential school and for her, it worked. It, it kind of, what, what they wanted to happen, happened to my great grandmother. She got out of the residential school and I'm sure it was because she was there at such a young age that she didn't believe it was good to be a first nations person. Um, she kept her hair blonde. She kept her skin light. She would wear sweaters. She, she wouldn't go outside much. And, and she truly believed being a first nations person was a terrible thing that you weren't going to succeed because of the color of your skin and the color of your hair and the color of your eyes. Because of the way you looked, you weren't going to succeed in this life. That's what she truly believed. Now, fortunately or unfortunately for, for me and, 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 and who I am today, um, she did meet an Indigenous man and fell in love. Um, he was from um, Six Nations. And his name was George, George Longboat. Um, so then they got married and they had uh, three, four, four kids, sorry. Um, and one of them was my grandmother, um, Loretta Longboat. And so again, when she was growing up, my nanny would actually put bleach in her water um, to keep her skin pale. That's how scared she was. That's how much she feared Indigenous people and their success and what people were going to think of them. She was going to, she was willing to take these extremes to protect her kids and, you know, in a way it was probably hurting them, but she thought she was doing the best that she could with, 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 with what she was doing. And so my, my, my nanny would bleach all my, and then she bleached my grand, my, my, my dad. Um, she would put bleach in his water and, and to try to keep his skin pale. Um, and even uh, my nanny growing up, um, when I go over to her house, they say, oh, make sure his hair is cut short, make sure it, um, wow, he looks pretty dark. I remember those comments. I never knew what it meant. Um, she loved me. She truly loved me. She was one of those typical nannies that would slip you a, a back in the day, I, I guess it was a $2 bill. She'd slip you that $2 bill and she'd be like, here, don't tell anybody I gave you this. 
And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I, I won't tell nobody. Thanks. I was like, my dad will be mad. He'll take it from me. He never would. Um, but Nanny was always like that. Um, she, she was that typical, had candy in her purse. I had the most amazing Werther's from her purse. Um, and, and so she, she truly loved me, but she, she was just so scared of who I was because my grandmother met my, my grandfather at a powwow and my great grandmother, Nanny actually met, um, her husband at a powwow. Um, and then my mom met my dad at a powwow. So, um, I don't, again, fortunately or unfortunately, I, I call it fortunate now, um, you know, even though that all of these things were, were pulled every which way and they were trying to get us, they were trying to keep, keep take the Indian out of us, I, I guess you could say, um, remove the Indian from the child, it, it didn't work, um, no matter how hard they tried. And, and even an example of my nanny as to what she, she went through and what she believed and what she did to try to stop it it didn't like love overpowered it. Um, my grandmother, she never knew anything, um, but it didn't feel wrong to her. My dad, he never really knew too much about what it meant to be uh, a Mohawk or an Oneida, um, but he lived on Oneida. He grew up with my grandpa, um, Martin White, and, and they grew up, he, my, my grandma and grandpa split up and he stayed on Oneida. Um, and some of them moved to where uh, Buffalo, New York, which is where my grandma lives now. Um, so they, um, my dad grew up on Oneida knowing who he was, but not knowing what it meant. He knew that he was an Oneida person, but what did that mean? He didn't have a very heavy understanding. Um, my grandfather was an alcoholic um, and it did take his life um, and he struggled with it. And, and even my dad struggled with it. Um, and, and he was an alcoholic when I was younger. Um, so when my mom and dad got together and they had me, um, they, they weren't very well off. I actually lived with my grandma and papa at a young age. And then I lived in a trailer and, and we didn't have money. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, but I always had a warm, happy, healthy family um, on, on Walpole Island. I, I never, that was where I was rich. I was, I was wealthy when it came to family. I didn't have money. I wasn't wealthy when it came to money, but I was wealthy when it came to family. Um, so I feel like that's, that's what's put me where I am today. Um, but growing up, we didn't have the money that we had. Uh, I lived with my grandparents and I lived in a trailer till I was uh, 12 years old. And then I moved to a subdivision, um, which had its own issues and, and, and problems here on Walpole Island because of the, the, the traumas that, that the other indigenous people around me were experiencing. Um, so, and then as I was growing up, I didn't know much about myself um, or what that meant to be uh, an Indigenous person. Um, I knew that I was an Ojibwe. I knew that my dad was from Oneida, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know what to, what to say about it. And I was a teenager and I was in my grade 10 religion class. And uh, my, my teacher, um, she was asking me, um, cause we would talk about these different things that happened, you know, in, in the Catholic religion, I went to the pines, I went to UCC. Um, and, and she asked me, she said, um, you know, what does that mean in, in being a native? In all honesty, she was saying Indian, you know, it was still an acceptable term. She said, what does that mean being an Indian? Um, and I was like, Oh, I'm an Ojibwe. And she goes, okay, what does that mean being an Ojibwe? How do you do this? How do you do that? And I could just feel myself sinking down in that, in, in my seat. Cause I didn't know, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to answer those questions. And after a while, she, she kind of got it. Um, and she had kept me after class one day. She's like, Tyler, stay here. So I did. And she apologized. She said, she said, I'm so sorry. Um, I didn't realize that you didn't know um, too much about it. And, and she, and she was trying to be very nice about it. Um, and I said, that's okay. And I told her, I was like, I, I, I guess I don't know. And that was my first realization in grade 10, I was 16 years old, that I was like, well, I don't know too much about this, do I? Um, and, and growing up, you know, I, again, I lived on the res, I had words, but even in high school, I was using those words and my friends were looking at me, they're like, what does beach mean? Beach means water. And I'd say beach and then I went home and I was like, I'd have to clarify with my mom. I'd be like, is beach an uh, English word or is it an Ojibwe word? She's like, oh, that's an English, yeah, Ojibwe word. Oh, okay. 
So that's why I was clicking in, but I was on that res life. I, I'd never been off the res until I started to go to, to high school. I really experienced friends from off the reserve. We all had the same um, thing growing up here. Um, we all knew what beach was. And so my teacher, again, she, she apologized and she said, well, why don't you find out? And she's like, why don't you, you go talk to somebody or ask somebody? There, there must be people that are out there that know more about it. And she's like, I see proud powwows all the time and stuff. And I thought about powwows. I was like, okay. I was like, I'll go, I'll go to a powwow. And I, I, I knew, um, actually, uh, I see Dallas is in here now too. I, I, I had a, my cousins um, were very big on the powwow circuit. And, and that was like the native thing, right? Like that's very visual of what it means to be an indigenous person is to go to a powwow celebration. So I was like, okay. So I asked my cousin, Matt, um, I, I said, you know, I, I don't know much. I was like, but I'm trying to find out more. And I, I was like, can I, I was like, can I go to a powwow with you? And he's like, yeah. Well, he's like, we got this drum group starting up. Um, me and my you know, other cousins, Nathan, Dan, Dallas is a part of it too. They had this drum group going. They're like, you should come with us. I was like, oh no, just, just kind of tell me what it means. I was like, tell me what you do. He's like, no, you got to be a part of it. You got to experience it. And, and I was like, no, I can't, I can't do that. that. That's your thing. I was like, just, just tell me what it means to, for what you do as a grass dance. And um, he was learning the language too. So he had more of the language. And I was, like, I was like, teach me some of the language and stuff like that. And he's like, come on, it'll be fun. And I kept denying it. And I was like, no, I can't go. I can't go. And then finally he's like, Hey, there's a lot of pretty girls there. I said, you pick me up at 8.30, I'll be ready and waiting, and I will go with you to these powwows. And uh, so I did. I started to go, and I would sit at the drum, and I was learning, but um, I, wasn't, I wasn't with them all the time. So as they were, as they were learning more and more, um, they were starting to get ahead of me a little bit there, and I tried to keep going, and I, at, at one point, I couldn't keep up anymore. But as I went to powwows, and I still traveled, um, I met this really pretty girl there um and and uh it was shannon and i eventually i married with her i stayed with her i stayed by her side the, the whole time um i always tell people uh, i'm lucky enough to have caught her at an early age because i don't know if, if she realizes that that might not be the best thing for her but i try to trick her every day and to make her realize that you know she she <laughs> that i i get to i deserve to be with her and sometimes i feel like i don't she's such an amazing person um but I, I, I had her at, you know, in grade 11, I, I made her laugh and that was it. Um, I was, I'm, I'm good at being funny and I try to make her laugh every day. So as we were growing up again, I, I kind of got into that. Um, but it, well, there wasn't much there when it came to, to knowing who I was as a, as a traditional person. And it wasn't until actually after college that I realized what, what I was experiencing and that I didn't know my language and that I didn't know much about what it meant to be an Ojibwe person. It wasn't until that apology um, in 2007 um, that was issued by at the, turn, at the time the conservative government. Um, and, and that's when my, my papa really started to talk about it and really started to come to light as to what it meant to be, um, what, what my papa had experienced. Then my, my grandma started to talk about it more and, and she knew that it was a connection between Nanny, that, that orphanage that, that she went to, the Mohawk Institute. So I started to learn more, and again, but not in college or high school. I had some idea, I had some quick understandings, but again, it, it wasn't heavy. Um, it, was, it was a teacher, it was my grade 10 religion teacher who sent me on this path of trying to figure out what it meant to be an Ojibwe person. And, and along the way, I did get a, a lot of great friends. I did meet a lot of great people. Um, experiencing it early and on in my life, but um, there was more to it than just powwows. Powwows are amazing. I love powwows. My wife loves powwows. Um, we love going. We're not right now, um, but there, there, there's definitely a lot more to it when it comes to being an Indigenous person, um, and and that was something I needed to learn along the way as well. Um, so as we as we as, as I got older. Um, I was 23, and, and then what it really took off is when my first, when my daughter was born. Um, she's 14 now. And uh, that's when I realized that I need to do something for her. I need to, I, and for myself, for that matter. I need to have a better understanding of who I am and what I, what I do and, and, and where I'm from and how I should be proud and how I should express it. And so 
I did. I started this journey and, and it's a journey that I'm going to continue on for my entire life. Um, I think about all of these different things that happen now and, and how I, how I, how I dealt with it, um, how I didn't understand it and that I'm not the only one um, that we all have different paths that we went on because of the past that, that came before us. Um, we're only, I'm only one, two gener two generations out of the residential school system. And I really believe in that seven generation principle that it takes seven generations for something to, to be undone, but we have to work at it. And so that, that's, that's, we're very early in this, in this learning and understanding um, as to where we need to go and where we need to be eventually. And it's going to go beyond my lifetime. And it's really going to go beyond my, my kids' lifetimes um, for them to get back to where we can be. And it requires a lot of work, um, not just by Indigenous people, but by uh, Turtle Island, everybody that's on Turtle Island, non-Indigenous people as well. Um, so I'm going to continue on. I have a little, um, I guess you can call it a, a little like case study that, that me, and, me and Tina kind of did with, this is a story from a friend of mine. Um, so I want you, everybody to kind of think about it who's here today, um, to think about where the trauma had happened. This is another um, father story and you can even put it in the chat if you have an idea as to something that pops up um, as to why you know why the way he was affected the way it happened you know what he could do and what he had to do and everything else um, so uh, 69 from Bikajanong now went to residential school at the age of 11 and after he spent four years there he never wanted to continue with education again and he never did he never wanted to he hated it he hated every experience with it um, then as he got older, um, he turned to alcohol to hide the memories, and that's unfortunately very common. Uh, but he was growing up, he got married, he had five kids. Um, he didn't know how to show affection because he wasn't shown affection when he was younger. Um, so again, if you think of anything in the chat as to, you know, what, how, what, what's carrying on um, with beyond what he experienced, that intergenerational trauma, where you can see it in here, go ahead and put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, again, so he did not how to know how to show affection because he wasn't shown affection when he was younger. Um, he was involved with a lot of domestic disputes and ar arguments with his wife. Um, he struggled with his self-worth worth and connection to Indigenous culture. Um, as the kids got older, they wondered why they never received physical affection from, from their father. Um, the children witnessed the substance abuse and domestic disputes and the arguing, and, and then the children started off the same way in their lives. And at one point the, in the turnaround, he recognized what was going on. Um, he quit drinking. He decided to help it raise his grandchildren with, with affection and to, to show them that love as, as he was realizing what he was experiencing. And as we carry on through this, this realization that um, we're all going through as Indigenous people. Um, he teaches his grandkids what he knows now, um, the past teachings that he, was, he, was, he was, had to come to learn and understand. Um, he learns with his family now. Uh, he's a avid hunt fisher and he shares that um, and he shares those experiences and that, you know, he has an understanding with the land um, and how important it is to take care of it and, and everything else. And finally, uh, the, his daughter has created her own thing that is focusing on Indigenous learning methods, um, like hands-on learning, you know, the way Indigenous people used to learn before brick and mortar schools and, and everything else. Um, and finally, he encourages people to help educate themselves. And uh, he realizes that education is important now, um, even though he didn't like it and it wasn't for him because of the education that he received. Um, he knows that it's important with the right teachers, with the right people and the right realization and the right understanding. Um, so that, that's where he carries on now. So we think about what he went through, um, the emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual of course, that's all carried on to the next generation, you know. He would not show emotion towards his children because of their lack of emotion that, uh, they experienced. Um, physical and sexual abuse would create barriers of, of physical affection. Um, the breakdown of your mind, substance abuse often kept the traumatic memories away, but only for a short amount of time that it would come back and it creates that vicious cycle um, that people got stuck in, um, that people are stuck in still to this day. Um, where they use alcohol to keep trying to take that memory away as it, it's, it's not permanent, it's only temporary. 
and then eventually all those memories come back and then they they, they start again and of course spiritual uh always that remove the indian from the child i do apologize i i for using the word indian yes i do understand it but that's 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 what they that's what the the churches and 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 priests and everybody they they that word was common and i feel like it's it's such a vulgar word now because it, it was always referred to as a savage or someone who was mean angry doesn't deserve to be here is, isn't the right type of person um so now when we say first nations uh more specifically you know you can you can ask the you know they can share their tribe you know their ojibwe their oneida their um Odawa, Potawatomi, one of the six nations, so uh, Kiuga, Onondaga, Tuscarora, Seneca. Um, it's nice to be able to identify as those, not just First Nations, or you can say you're Métis from, from this settlement, um, you know, in the, in, the Alber in, in the Edmonton, Alberta area and stuff like that, um, or Inuit from, from the, the great places up north that they have, um, and where their, a lot of their culture is, is, is where they can kind of navigate themselves to and it's always nice to be able to to say exactly where you're from um and I, that's what i'm very proud of and i'm very proud to say that's why i told you at the beginning i'm proud to say i'm from Bikajanong. i'm from the oneida nation of the thames um, my grandmother is from Agwasasni. um my grandfather's from six nations um territory and and you know my my grandfather and my grandmother they're Bikajanong territory they're anishinaabe people um, I'm very proud to, to be able to say I'm a part of that and, and uh, I'm proud to be that. Um, so to remove the Indian from the child is obviously what they're getting at. And that's something that we need to work on breaking um, because I feel like that's still something that affects us and that we need to move forward from. So um, I guess some ways as, as how can you help um, as an educator? And this is kind of what things and there are many more to them that you may realize or that you may have you know um Zhao and dallas gretchen they 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 all have more that 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 they can share as well or maybe you know we're all learning at the same time as well i think it's important to realize that i myself um that i'm still learning i, I talk about what i know you know about anishinaabe culture and, and oneida culture haudenosaunee culture um, I say I know like a, a little portion of a book that's probably, you know, that big, and that book isn't written down because we're oral tradition, oral tradition people. Where it's it's stories and and hands on, sent through generation to generation that we sit and we listen. That's it's a big part of it, and and I'm learning all the time. I'm, I'm like at the tip of the iceberg, and when it comes to to understanding and realizing. Um, what it means to be an Ishtabe, but I'm proud to say of what I do know, uh, I know well, and, and I have the ability to stand before you here today and, and kind of locate and, and tell you a bit about myself today, but, um, and I, I hope that you, that, uh, that, it, that I can show my confidence in this um, after what, you know, my grandparents have been through, um, that I'm, you know, starting to move forward. So, you can educate yourself uh, and understanding that. So this is for students. How can you help students um, understand that their trauma, past or present, affects their current way of life? Um, and there's much there's a lot to that. Um, rec is not recognize that they may not understand that they have intergenerational trauma. So like I said, when I was growing up, when I was in high school, I didn't realize that, you know, I was I had these effects that I had these, these, these things that I didn't understand because of what had happened in my, in, in my past and with my, my family. Um, and then they may be at that same spot too. They may not realize, you know, what, what's going on or, or that they have this intergenerational trauma or when they hear it, they don't think they have it um, because I didn't think I have it. Um, recognize that indigenous students may be at different stages of their own understanding uh, with their indigenous culture. That one's very important um, because I have some students that I work with and, and we're both here on Walpole Island as well that had a heavy understanding or a better understanding um, and, and go to ceremonies and, 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 you know, 
were able to speak more of the language because they were raised a little bit differently. And then I had some students who weren't at that same spot. So it, it is, it's really hard in your classrooms, especially if you have a heavier Indigenous student population in your classroom, you got to realize that that one may not understand what the other one, where the other person is at, or even what they're saying. You can't bunch them all into one and say, you guys all know this, right? Yeah, there might be one and they may be friends, but they might not know, you know, what the, that, that have a heavy or deep understanding as to what the other one is talking about. And it's important to, to recognize that, um, that their own, they're in their own stages, even in the classroom, um, that, you know, you're going to have these different people who may, you know, they may be able to talk, speak the language, they may be able to tell you about ceremonies, they may be able to tell you about traditions, and, and then there's some that can't, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and of course, respect what they do know. And I think it's important because, um, again, we are the oral tradition people. We are people who um, hear stories, and, and sometimes those stories vary. Ultimately, they carry the same discipline, they carry the same meaning, but you know they, the the little bits and pieces in there might might be a little bit different. Um, so you may hear a story from one person, or it wouldn't even, maybe not even a student. It could be an adult. It could be a family member. They may tell you a story that they've heard or share with something that they know, and you may have heard something similar, but it sounds a little bit different. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just real. It's just for us to realize that um, indigenous people. Uh, our oral tradition people. Uh, none of this stuff is written down. Well, okay, a little bit more is written down in, in, um, in our present time with the social media that we live in. I do admit that I've gotten some, some good readings and some good understandings as I was uh, growing up, or <laughs> like I shouldn't say growing up now, I've read a little bit more and it's been nice to do so. But ultimately, those big stories and ceremonies, those come from when we go to those places. We, we take the time to go and, and search up what we want to know, what we want to learn, those ceremonies that we want to be a part of. Um, it's up to us to make sure that we're finding the right people that we trust um, to help us with those, those understandings and, and, and everything else. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't bring the water with me. Um, <laughs> kind of going, getting, getting uh, dry here. So recognize the oral tradition. Again, so that's what I was just talking about. Indigenous learning did not originally involve sitting in a classroom. We all learn differently. And I think that's blood memory. Um, you know, sometimes they may be better with hands on um, and, and realizing that, you know, the oral tradition is it's in our blood. It's in it's who we are. That's passed on from generation to generation as well. Um, you know, learning by doing. And that's the way I was. It was always easier for me to just experience it rather than writing it down or reading a book um, about what has happened. I was better when it just happened and when I, when I was a part of it, and then I could understand it. So high school and, and elementary school wasn't a struggle, but I'd say high school was more of a struggle. There's a lot more reading, but elementary was okay, but it was definitely because I, I was better with the hands-on stuff. I was better with... Um, people telling talking about it when the teacher would read the book out loud that's when I understood it because I was listening I couldn't read it myself and that's of course just understanding that we all learn differently and that may be for all students all students might have their own different ways of learning um, but you know that when it comes to indigenous learning um, and indigenous uh, pedagogy that was what we had first um, and these last two are, are, are kind of you know, seeking out the facts. Um, if you don't understand something that may be in your curriculum or, or in your stories or in, in the, the stuff, it, it, it's okay to try to find those knowledge keepers. Or like a lot of the schools now, you have people like Zhao and Dallas and Gretchen and, and a lot more others. Um, and we have a lot in our school board too that are, that are kind of able to help, you know, realize, you know, what can be told by you and what maybe we should listen to or maybe not tell there there's that fine line of appropriation versus appreciation um and, and that's something that that it's it's a very fine line it's very tough to navigate uh, even as an indigenous person i know that as well 
and I can't imagine there, there's some difficult questions, difficult moments that probably come in your classroom where you wish you had the answer or you wish that you could, but maybe it's not your spot. Um, it's not your time. And it's okay to, to, to ask those difficult and un uncomfortable questions. Um, asking an, an, uncom an uncomfortable question is, is probably a good thing. Um, they're difficult conversations to have, but they need to happen um, if we wanna move forward with, uh, with uh, this indigenous way of learning and, and including indigenous people um, in, uh, in our schools and, and, and you know, making them feel welcome. Uh, and it's nice to have those uncomfortable conversations with people that you know, like, like Zhao and in Dallas and, and all of them, because you can have a better or maybe a more comfortable conversation with a family member or a student um, somebody that that you can say, um, you know, some 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 knowledge that you'll find. And, you know, it may involve speaking to traditional knowledge keepers, people that, you know, elders and, and, and people that want to come in and talk about more about what they know. Um, and that that's very important. If you have people willing and to do it and you trust them and and, and they're willing to uh, to help. Um, but of course, never keep them as a one and done thing we never want to check that just check the box off we didn't bring them in just to check the box off to say that yes you covered the indigenous curriculum we always want to make sure that we follow up and we have a true understanding as to what it means to to have those knowledge keepers share their knowledge and i think i believe that's very important um when it comes to to the curriculum and and learning with um learning the indigenous curriculum and and what you have to teach and, and what needs to create awareness and realization and stuff like that. We always may, need to make sure that we follow through with, with those people that are coming in and willing to spend their time, that they're not just doing it once because you can't do this just in one class. Um, you know, you need to follow up, you need to allow them to guide and, and everything else if they're willing to. Um, you'd be very fortunate if you do find people that are willing to do that, and there are. Um, and, and it's, it's very important that we don't just check a box, but we follow through with, with what we're understanding and what we're uh, bringing to uh, the students, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, and uh, I think this last one is uh, understanding that tradition and knowledge is protected by the people who carry them. So you may ask somebody, a knowledge keeper, about you know something and they may say no. They may say they'd rather not. And again, that's just from history. That, that's from what they've probably experienced more than likely. Um, the people who carry that knowledge, they may not want to tell anybody. They might, may want only certain people to know about it. They may not want you to know about it. Um, and that's okay. Never take that as an insult. Um, if they're going to hang on to that, then, you know, that, that's, what they, that's what they deserve to do. Because at one point, maybe they weren't allowed to hang on to it. At one point, maybe their grandparents weren't allowed to hang on to it. Um, my grandparents weren't allowed to hang on to it. So they're going to protect it very hard and they're going to do whatever they can because they have a wall up and they deserve to have that wall up. Um, and, and we just have to understand that and we have to keep moving forward. So to end here, um, I hope I didn't talk your ear off too much. Um, I just wanted to, to say uh, miigwech. Um, and my, my grandpa told me one day as we were sitting down, um, he, he told me and uh, I was just sitting there by myself, um, but he, he kind of looked at me and he knew what I did. He knew that I helped students. He knew that I worked in schools. And he, he said, I like what you and Robin do. Robin is my cousin. Um, and she, she does the similar work um, as to what I do at the LKDSV, Robin Isaac. You, I'm sure some of you have seen her or met her. Um, and, and he said that, and so I said, you know, what, what can I do to help them to, to, to bring that realization? And I remember he, he said this line, he said, well, <clears throat> Tyler froze. I'm worried about uh, his Wi-Fi in the parking lot there. He may have got cut off just at his final statement. Do you have a, do you have his, his, he's going to have his phone number contact you? Um, yes, I do, but let me just grab my phone. Uh -oh. 
even if you, even if you could call he's him. frozen if anybody even if you could okay, call perfect him on the phone for a second just to close things up could we uh, open the yep. chat for a question while during this time yeah the chat is open i believe if yep if anybody to it. if anybody has any questions for tyler please use the q and a We'll get Zhao to unmute herself when she's ready. We can get a, an update. Oh, there he is. He's back. Okay, bye. Okay, I was just putting him on speaker, but he says he's back now. We can't hear you yet, Tyler. He's got no microphone showing up, just his camera no. on the system. That's okay if he can't. And again, on reserve, our internet is so sketchy that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it goes in and out. It is so unreliable. So we have a few comments there which i appreciate all his time and sharing his story and you know he didn't get necessarily into that but more about how educators can help and that 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 intergenerational trauma does get passed down that it's not just those children that were taken away it's all those generations yet to come and the session earlier this afternoon talked that science of passing that dna trauma down generation and like he says it's about seven generations that we believe it takes to change something or to not be affected by what has happened within that set which is a long long span of time so in earlier and in the last few days we're learning that and people are sharing their stories but also saying it's not just on indigenous people we can't do this alone, that we need that partnership. We need that relationship to be able to change those, to help the, all of that trauma. And especially with our students, that it comes from, well, if we look across our board, we see a significant number of teachers that are non-Indigenous. And we only have a small few that are Indigenous and that we have to work hard in order to reach our Indigenous students. And I hope that's really what we have been highlighting this past week and even next week. This is our last session for this week. And we have another eight more sessions next week, which we are excited to, to have. And to, um, if there's any questions that come up that arise from this, there he is. Is he back on? Can you hear us? Maybe, no. Yeah, he just unmuted. I am. He is. <clears throat> so Ty Tyler, just to bring you I'm up. I'm here. Uh, good stuff. You know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna... You, 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 you had said, you were just gonna finish a story. Someone always said, or some. Um, my grandpa always said, you know, we can't do this um, without the help of uh, non-indigenous people. As indigenous people, we can't move forward in Canada or North America from, um, from what we're at, where we're at now, we need the help of non-Indigenous people to help move us forward as Indigenous people. We can't do this alone. And that's something I take uh, from my papa. And I take those words and I hold them to, to, to them and I hold them to my heart because I'm surrounded by people who want to help. And the people that are here today at, in the PD session, they're, they're, there's a reason they're here. It's because they want to help. They want to be allies. They want to be learners. Um, they want to understand. And uh, that's it. That I was almost there. I'm glad I'm there now. Um, that was all I wanted to say. So that, that that's the end of my presentation. Jawin, do you want to share some of the comments in the Q and A there? 
Yes, perfect. So Tyler, we've had a lot of great comments um, from Jolene DeGers McDonald. Miigwech for your stories. I'm glad you shared your story, your story of your grandfather as, as, a, as it is another narrative of how children were stolen, an ice cream cone. Every child loves ice cream. If this happened today, parents would be infuriated. She also mm -hmm. said, um, I was talking about the unreliable Wi-Fi, and she says, the realities of education on reserve, another way that education is unequitable, the lack of Wi-Fi slash service, et cetera. This seven generations is non-Indigenous, is non-Indigenous commitment to change as well. My actions are seen and felt by my children. They are aware. Their children will be aware and hopefully that continues to be passed forward. This is how reconciliation on the part of non-Indigenous can move forward. Miigwech there, and we have Derek Stanton says, thank you, Tyler, for sharing your story and the story of your family for generations. I am wondering if you can share more, more details about the Open Minds program with the Greater Essex Board. So Gretchen, Miigwech, Tyler, I'm so proud of you. And those are the comments for tonight's session. So Miigwech, Tyler, I didn't even get to thank you because you got kicked off. I was gonna race down to the mall and see if I could catch you, knock on your window, uh, but I don't have to now. So miigwech for, <laughs> miigwech for sharing tonight. I appreciate, you know, giving up your time on this beautiful evening and that we set aside um, for you to share your knowledge. And, you know, it, you have come a long way. And just like Gretchen said, I'm proud of you from seeing you in the hallway and, you know, gabbing with you and kind of, you know how we just make fun of each other but to see you with that those youth and how you interact is amazing and the connections that you build with those students is phenomenal in so many different ways and those connections that you have just with the community it is amazing to have you know a school board have you on their staff is an asset and you know having you here to present to our teachers is a great asset as well. So um, I wanna say miigwech. And if you have any last words, we may have another um, question in there. Tina DeCastro says, your experience is invaluable and the Open Minds team is so fortunate to have you. So if you wanted to leave any oh, last I didn't realize words. I didn't realize Tina was in here. Um, I didn't I, I was. I was talking her up and she was here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Tina is, is my co-worker and and again um the open minds program we do a lot um there's a lot that i can explain i know there's only two minutes left maybe i can answer that question about um he was wanting to know more about the open minds program um maybe i can i can get into a better detail about what i do and stuff like that and what we do as a team um in the future there so i can i can maybe answer that because there's only one minute left i don't want to keep anybody have a nice evening out on the porch uh the the humidity isn't here yet for us islanders the bugs aren't quite here yet the mosquitoes aren't here so we can still be outside for probably about another week or so so i hope everybody enjoys their week the week their long weekend coming up stay home i know it's it's a hard thing to do I, i'm struggling with it myself i'm a traveler i like to be out and about but i'm going to do my best to stay home i've seen this new plan that's got me kind of happy and and, and I seeing that Ontario is at least we can do something if anything. Um, so I just encourage everybody to be safe, um, be happy and be healthy. Miigwech uh, Jawan, Miigwech Gretchen, Dallas. Um, I, I love the LKDSB team. Um, I know them all so well. Uh, it's, I've been fortunate enough to walk the halls of WDSS and help out there. And now I'm fortunate enough to be at the Greater Essex County District School Board, um, helping out the best that I can there. Um, so uh, after, having said all that, just miigwech for taking the time to be here this evening. Miigwech, Tyler, we appreciate that. And um, now you just jinxed us because the bugs will probably be here tomorrow when you said we had a week. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will enjoy one last week without the bugs. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> Miigwech everybody for taking the time tonight and this is our last session for the week. Next week on Tuesday we have our keynote speaker um, Ted Nolan and he has just recently put out a documentary 
on his experiences with racism in the NHL. So that'll be a good talk. I believe he's on at 345 on Tuesday. Um, so miigwech for joining our sessions and we look forward to another great week. Miigwech Tyler and everybody who joined uh, tonight. Have a great evening. Bama P. Bama P everybody. <laughs>